And here we are with exercise five of Fundamentals of Mocha. And we're looking at rotation this time, as you can see in this clip here. Now, again, the job we've got uh, before us is to try and get a good track on this card. And this is either going to involve getting good corner pin data or good uh, rotation data as well. Now, both of these things are actually quite difficult to achieve with regular point trackers. Uh, and the reason for that is that if we're just doing uh, a, a point track for getting transform data, say we just want to match move um, some text going in uh, along a car or something like that, that's actually just one uh, piece of good data that we've got to get out of, uh, of this entire image here. So if we can find one good point, then we're, we're laughing and everything's good. Now, if we want to track scale and rotation using a regular point tracker, that means that we've got to take two points. We've got to find one in one area and then another one, a sort of suitable distance away that's gonna let the software calculate the difference between point one and point two, and then work out the scale and rotation from that. So that means we need two good bits of data that are a decent size, a, a decent distance apart. So let's have a look here, because this is actually some quite challenging material, because we've got a whole load of motion blur that goes on around the edges, obscuring quite a lot of detail going on here. Now, if we wanted to get corner pin data using traditional point or feature trackers, then that's four bits of data that we need that have a good relationship to each other that we can then offset to the corners of our image here. And you can tell straight away that this gets exponentially more complex the, the, the higher the number of, uh, of good point trackers that you need are. Oh, and that's, yeah, that's one of the, the things that, uh, that makes planar tracking a lot easier is that here we can, we can try a couple of different things. We can try a sort of traditional approach and I'm gonna go for an area where, it, where things are looking static. There we go, relatively stable frame 59 here. I always look for the, the sort of best uh, place to, uh, to start the track, obviously. And we can just start with one of the center areas here. So just start with a little bit of the plane here. For this demonstration, I'm going to turn my shear off. Now, because of the way this is moving, it's not in an ideal world where things, where, well, where this is just rotating. There is some small amount of movement in, or small amount of rotation in both X and, uh, and Y. So we're not just having circular rotation uh, as we would do with just a 2D object. You know, there is a tiny amount uh, but an appreciable amount of, uh, of rotation going on in both the X and the, the Y here. But despite all that, I'm going to turn shear off and see how we get on. And this I'm going to call center cut zero one. I'm going to run a few little tests for, for you here. So I've got my minimum percentage of pixels up at 90. That's the default. Large motion is turned on. Everything else is set to the default of auto and zero, zero here. And let's just see what we get when we track this back. Okay, so it's fitting in quite nicely. We find, found a nice little area there. So let's turn on our surface here. We'll come back to our original frame. and Push our surface out to the corners just so we can get a quick test of how this is looking. And we'll play that back. And you can see that despite us just tracking a very small amount, and we do have significant amount of rotation going on, it's held quite true. I think the time where we see things slipping properly is around about there. But then it catches up again and is fine at the end. So we track that through with just a very small area of the uh, of the total surface here uh, and that was quite interesting and we've got quite a good result going on i'm going to track this forwards a little bit more i'm going to set a keyframe at, at frame 59 just so i remember what's going on and let's just track that through as it goes through something a little bit more complex here so you can see we're starting now if i leave my uh, surface turned on 
which is starting to maybe see a little bit more drift, but it's still handling that rather nicely. And it's getting towards the end here. We can see it is drifting off quite a quite an amount. And at the end we're we're quite we're quite far off. So let's see what I can do just with a couple of small changes. Come back to frame 58. I'm just going to make a duplicate of this here. So over in the layer controls, I'm going to duplicate the object down here. This one's called center cut two. And I'm going to make one change. And I'm just going to get rid of the rest of the, the tracking frames here. Just so that I'm not influencing anything else. You can see that all I'm going to do is just make this one change. If we look down here at the angle, I said I was going to come back to this at a later exercise, and here we are. Now, the angle here gives Mocha a hint at how much uh, this object is rotating from, uh, from frame to frame. So with an angle set at zero, we're not explicitly telling Mocha that there's any rotation going on in this image. And yet, if we look back at the... Let's just lock this one up so we don't accidentally move it. If we look back at the job that it did here, it's still done a pretty pretty fine job, I think, for, for what we told it. But if I make this one change and tell it that, yeah, we've got a maximum angle change of six degrees from uh, one frame to the next frame. And let's just see what a difference that makes. And let's just see what a difference that's made. So I'm gonna to go to our first version and then our second version. Now in this, in this instance, it's actually made a surprisingly small difference. And that's, I think, because our first version was actually so, so good. Uh, and the, the drift, the main drift that we're seeing here isn't because of the rotation in, in Z, the circular rotation that we've been tracking. Actually, the main um, rotation we've got going on here is in Y. So it's actually moving in 3D space. So I just want to see one more thing. I want to see if I can get a better result than this here by drawing a uh, another shape that actually takes in more of our frame. So I turn off the visibility on the other two, lock both the center cuts up there. And I'll call this one center large one. Do the same as before. Well, let's let's keep everything pretty much as it was before. So minimum percentage used uh, 30 here, large motion. I'm gonna set my angle up again to what it was before, which was six. And at this point I can actually set my um set my surface up here if I want to see things as as I want to see my surface tracking or moving as we're tracking through. And let's just track that forwards. And there we go. Now, the, the first thing that um, I'm going to say about tracking this larger object is that it did take a, uh, a good amount of time longer to track than the smaller object did. And let's take a look at what the quality of the track actually is. We can see there's a, a small. Let's have a look a bit closer. So this is the small track and this is the large object. So we can see there is a, uh, a difference by tracking through the larger object here. Again, we have those both on top of each other. There's pretty much negligible difference going on. So what I want to show here is that bigger isn't always going to be better. But if we take a look at these overlaid on top of each other, We can see the small cut and the larger one. Out of the, large, out of the two, the larger object is actually um, slightly more accurate across the entire range of the, uh, of the clip. And if we turned on shear and perspective, as we'll look at in the, uh, the next exercise, you know, that's going to be even more accurate there.
Now, if we did want to make this uh, really spot on accurate, um, let's turn off my spline here because I've now finished with the tracking. So I can turn off the tracking markers here. Yeah, if I do want to make this absolutely accurate across here, what I can do is start to compensate for some of the drift that's going on here. And to do that, I would use my adjust track. Now, two words of caution before we even touch the adjust track here. And the first one is the most important one. It's the one I see time and time again, people getting this wrong. The adjust track shouldn't be used to make up for bad tracking data. So let's, let's um, put this in a different way. If your first track and your first result is bad, you shouldn't automatically just jump to the adjust track to try to fix it. Because the adjust track here is a manual process. And when it comes to getting a spot on result with tracking data, the more stuff you can get done automatically, the better. Because any time that we try to, to add our manual sort of any sort of manual compensation to it, we run the risk of um, being ever so slightly out on our track. And it's those very small um, mistakes that when you see things running at full speed, um, those are the ones that are often the most obvious. And you can see these sort of mistakes all over the place. You can even see these on um, high budget network TV shows where things, you know, where deadlines are coming down to a crunch and, you know, you'd, you've got a track that's just not working. So what you try and do is get you get the best result you can at the automatic one and then you sort of manually fudge the, uh, the rest of the data. And, you know, those sort of small mistakes can be seen. It's, it's usually a lot better to sort of spend a little bit more time just scrapping the track that, uh, that you've got and sort of coming at it from a, from a different angle. And that's one of the things that comes from, from experience because, you know, good, good tracking is uh, an art form. You know, we've got some really powerful tools here, but at, at the end of it, you know, the tools are only as powerful as the people who are, who are using them. And that, that's, that's probably quite a long way of going around saying that um, if you can avoid doing any sort of manual uh, adjustments, then, then don't do them. And the other thing to look out for when you're doing an adjust track is make sure that the um, frame that you're starting off at is actually a good frame. And I, I like to, uh, to call it the, the last good frame that you've got. So if we look at our footage here and we go through the first few frames here are actually pretty good. In fact, even here where we've got, it looks like a little bit of slippage, but I think that's probably going to be more motion blur than anything else. Except when it comes to a stop and we realize it's not good there. So maybe the last good frame is, is here just before the, um, before the rotation starts. And at my last good frame, I'm going to add or, or go into the adjust track here and it's going to create up my first keyframe here and set my master point. What the adjust track is doing is it's not getting rid of the, uh, the track that we've got. We can still see the track that we've created. What we're doing is we're building on top of this. We're building, let's just um, pan that over there. So we're actually adding keyframes on top of the tracking keyframes that we've got. And these are linear keyframes. So what we're looking for at this point here is we're looking from we're looking to move from our last good frame, which in this case is frame number seven, to what I like to think of as the next worst frame. So the frame where everything sort of just goes goes wrong and then doesn't get any more wrong for for quite a while. So here, if we look at our uh, our view monitor over here, I'm looking at my current frame. I can see that as I move forward which I'm doing by holding down the um, command key on Apple, control key on Windows, and using the arrow keys left and right. So what I'm looking at here is as I get to frame 23, I can see that we're quite far out. We're at the corner point, but the corner point's not where it's meant to be. But if I move to frame 24, we're still out, but we're the same distance out as we were at frame 23. So frame 23 is our next worst frame. So this is the frame where we want to add our next keyframe. 
and we can come down to our nudge tools down here and we can just hit auto and that will try to identify where my um, where my point is in comparison to the master frame and it will search using the auto nudge it will search by looking at my region which is five pixels by five pixels I can turn that up if I want to but I don't want to five pixels there um, and it will look a maximum of 15 pixels in the X and Y so uh, this is our search range basically and it will go in and it will automatically add a keyframe for me so now if I look back let's just start to move frames backwards here what we should be doing is we should be getting a nice consistent movement as we move through our frames if we're not we need to check whether our last good frame was actually our last good frame and whether our worst frame was the worst frame. So we can come in, or we can check it out here, maybe add another keyframe here. Rotation is actually quite a tricky one, uh, always quite a tricky one actually. I think there, if we look at the, uh, the zoom window here, we can see that's now a nice consistent movement. And that stays fairly consistent until about here where I can see it drifting out again. So good frame, good frame, good frame. Good frame, good frame. Last good frame. You can see that, that drifting out there. So that's my last good frame. So I want to add another keyframe, which I do in the bottom right hand corner here. Boom. Now I can move over and find my next worst frame. which is probably going to be just before this starts to move again. Hit auto, check that out. If I am getting a bit of drift here, which I am, as you can see, it goes to the right, then to the left. Then I'm going to get rid of that keyframe in the middle because I want to be using the fewest number of keyframes possible. And it's saying to me that that isn't giving me nice smooth motion and we can either you know we can do this either in, in one of two different ways we can either do this uh on a corner by corner basis so we can go through and nudge each of the corners and then work on the next one we can go to our other corners by clicking down the interface down by our nudge and then work on the other ones or as we get to each keyframe we can come in and just see what's going on in the other corners as well. And that's that's probably the way that I prefer. So now the final thing with the adjust track for now is if you do find yourself adding keyframes every couple of frames or you know every frame, then there is something very, very wrong with your track. Uh, and it's far better to actually spend a bit of time um, getting like retracking, just trashing this, like hitting that, sending it into the garbage, doing it again, tracking something else that's coplanar, something that's sitting on the same plane as the object that you're wanting to track and uh, and try and work it work it that way. Cool, so we've had a look, look at uh, Adjust Track, which we'll be working with throughout the rest of the course. And we've also had a look at how adding angle and changing the size of your shape can have an influence on the quality of the tracking you can get especially when we're dealing with objects that do have a, uh, a large amount of rotation and subsequent motion blur as well. In the next exercise, we're going to be looking at shear and perspective and uh, when we use those and what the differences are. So join me in exercise six. Mm -hmm.